Okay, I'm going to call on the stage the, uh, our next speakers in the order they are going to present. So first up will be uh, Vanessa Parley. is Director of Research Programs at the Human Centered AI. She leads the AI High uh, Grant Programs, uh, Research Convening Student Groups, and State of AI Reports, such as the AI 100 and the AI Index, and she's a member of the Steering Committee. Uh, her team analyzes, also analyzes the effectiveness of these programs to continually improve on the human-centered AI ability. So the human-centered AI is a very large institute here at Stanford, um, and to foster interdisciplinary research collaboration, internal and external to Stanford. Uh, so prior to Stanford, Vanessa worked in management consulting, where she utilized statistics, machine learning, and data science uh, to advise government agencies, large biotech companies, and nonprofit. Organization, Vanessa holds an M uh, MS in energy, uh, engineering management and computational mathematics from Johns Hopkins and BA in industrial engineering from Arizona State University. Welcome, Vanessa. Yeah. All right. Okay, next up is uh, Michael Kochendorfer. Michael Kochendorfer is professor of aeronautics and astronautics here at Stanford University. He is director of the Stanford Intelligent Systems Lab, or called CISL, uh, conducting research on advanced algorithms and analytical methods for the design of robust decision making. Prior to joining the faculty in 2013, he was at MIT Lincoln Laboratory where he worked on aircraft collision avoidance, leading to the creation of the ACAS-X uh, international standards for manned and unmanned uh, aircraft. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Edinburgh and bachelor's and master's in computer science from Stanford. Uh, Professor Kochendorfer is a co-director also of the Center for AI Safety. He's an author of the textbook called Decision Making Under Uncertainty, uh, which uh, just came out, I think, with MIT Press. Welcome, Michael. And finally, our next speaker is uh, Dr. John Mern. is currently the senior decision scientist at Cobalt Metals. He implements machine learning and planning methods to create our intelligent systems to support critical mineral exploration. His expertise is focused uh, around optimization of complex tasks under uncertainty. John received a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Washington University in St. Louis and an MS and PhD from Stanford University in the Michaels uh, Silsel Group. Uh, in CISL, his research explored reinforcement learning and Monte Carlo planning for large-scale decision problems. Uh, and he has published research applying these methods to a variety of fields such as wind farm design, critical infrastructure, cyber security, aquifer remediation, and now, of course, uh, mineral exploration. Okay, we'll start up with Vanessa. Thank you, everyone, for having me, and thank you to Jeff and David for inviting me to speak. So the last 10 years have been some of the most consequential in the history of AI, or if many of you have been looking at the news or Twitter, the last six months seem to actually have been quite consequential. Um, and the next 10 years or 10 months promise to be even more so. Stanford has a rich network of labs and research that is complementary to each other and led by some of the most influential AI researchers. Um, Stanford also has a very prominent role in the AI landscape. Um, John McCarthy, the computer scientist who first coined the term artificial intelligence, was actually a Stanford researcher or a Stanford faculty. And all of this is woven into a diverse academic community. So um, you can see this. Uh, map here. The School of Sustainability is relatively in the middle of campus, all within walking distance to the School of Engineering, the Computer Science Department, the School of Medicine, um, Education, etc. And all of this is in the heart of Silicon Valley, which remains an influential voice in the world of technology. And having access to this ecosystem comes with a lot of responsibility, which is why the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence was created in 2019. Um, there's, we are rigorously grounded in AI, embedded in the Stanford ecosystem of diverse expertise, further embedded in Silicon Valley. So in 2019, when HAI was 
created. The hu idea of human-centered AI was relatively new. Not all, but most of the research was um, very technical focus, the computer scientists. There wasn't much talk about responsible AI, ethical AI, human-centered AI. Um, but now there are global institutions and organizations who are titled responsible AI, ethical AI, and are really studying the impacts of AI on all of society, which got us thinking more recently about whether we need to further define or create some sort of framework on what human-centered AI actually means. Um, I, this is an ongoing conversation, so I welcome questions or discussion during the panel or over lunch. Our vice director, James Landay, has put some thought into this and often says that creating technology that just impacts humans and calling that human-centered AI isn't enough. After all, why would we be creating technology if it weren't to hopefully positively impact um, humans? He says that the approach needs to be first user-centered, so understanding the needs of the users, um, iterating and, and um, further understanding those needs, testing those needs over and over. But still, that is not enough. It needs to be community-centered as well, understanding the interactions those users have within their communities, how the communities interact with those users, um, those users' families, um, perhaps structural barriers that those users face. And it should also be society-centered. What is the larger impact on society were this technology to become ubiquitous? Um, and how do we design that research to mitigate potential negative society impacts? So our goal at HAI is to foster interdisciplinary AI research, education, and policy programming that improves the human condition or society overall. We do this in a few different ways, one of which is our grant programming. So as many of you may know, it is quite difficult to work on interdisciplinary research projects, especially in academia where your different expertise have different ways of working, they have different languages. And one way we have found works well to incentivize this interdisciplinary work is through funding. We have a few different grant programs. The smallest is 75,000, which is a seed grant, and the largest goes up to two and a half million, which uh, researchers can get over a three-year period. And you can see from this chart, over time, our network of funded researchers has grown more dense. In 2018, the chart is pretty sparse. The dots are faculty members, and the colors are the departments where they come from, and the lines are funded research together. By 2022, we start to see clusters of researchers working together, and those clusters are pretty colorful. So we don't really see the, the medicine people only working together or the humanities people only working together. Um, one of the goals of our grant programs, not only to foster interdisciplinary research, but it's also to seed new ideas so the researchers can go on and get funding, more funding elsewhere. Um, so we try to fund work that might not have yet initial data or might be a little bit too early or ambitious to get funding elsewhere. Um, I once heard a joke that the NSF doesn't fund your work until you're almost done with that work. So this is trying to fill that gap. Um, and this pink bar here is the seed funding we have distributed um, to the Stanford community. And the blue bar is the uh, follow-on funding that those researchers have received. Um, examples include from the NSF, um, the US State Department, the National Institute of Mental Health. Um, and I will say that Jeff and Michael's work is a good example of um, our grant programs fostering this interdisciplinary work as it started off um, as a seed grant. All of our grant proposals go through what we call an ethics and society review. So before getting funded, the researchers need to put together a one-page summary of what they think the societal or ethical risks will be um, and how they plan to mitigate those through their research methodology. And those one-pagers are reviewed by this um, ethics and society board. If the board thinks that it looks fine, they recommend it a yes for funding by HAI. Um, 
Sometimes about a third of the proposals end up iterating with the Ethics and Society Review. And when we ask the researchers how they felt about that process, many do say that it did positively impact how they thought about their research, how they thought about the methodology, and how they actually ended up um, executing that work. So a few example projects. This ad, Biomechanics, is part of a larger Hoffman-E grant that I mentioned with the goal to develop an AI-enabled exoskeleton. So they, um, in order to do that, you need to ha build a model that can predict how the human body works, how you're walking, if you trip, like how you might uh, rectify that trip. But there wasn't enough data to actually do that, and not, definitely not enough data in the public space. So they are developing a large public data set of human motion that includes like the physics and mechanics around um, our bodies. And at addbiomechanics.org, um, they are gathering community input. Within the first two weeks of launching this, they had over 100 universities sign up, over 13 gigabytes of uh, human motion data. With all of the excitement around these large language models, I'm sure many of you have heard about ChatGPT, um, we need to understand what the risks are, what these systems can and cannot do. Um, so the Center for Research on Foundation Models, which is a center under HAI led by Percy Liang, has developed a new benchmark to more holistically evaluate the models. Um, previously, most of the benchmarks were really focused on accuracy or just one dimension, but that didn't think about um, the potential bias or toxicity of these models. So, so far, they have benchmarked over 30 prominent language models against what they call Helm. And these are open models, closed source models from Google, DeepMind, Meta. And they invite community input to um, add new models, add new benchmarks, or add new metrics or scenarios. And then given Mineral X is um, through the School of Sustainability, I thought I would talk a little bit about our sustainability work. Um, so this is a project on, focused on monitoring the ocean. So as some of you may know, the oceans are very difficult to monitor due to their sheer size and um, complex geopolitical landscape. Um, this team demonstrated the utility of satellite imagery powered by AI to complement um, the GPS-based vessel tracking data and then using that to serve as a new data source to monitor um, kind of the vessels and the oceans. So they are working with an organization called Global Fishing Watch, which is a nonprofit that has open source data on vessel movement um, and are hoping to work further with kind of governments and companies to help monitor. So along with our grant programming, we host working groups in an attempt to bring researchers together that wouldn't usually be in the same room. So over the past six months, um, we've been hosting an AI and sustainability working group, co-led by Professor Sarah Billington representing sustainability and J Professor Jeanette Bogg representing AI. And the goal of this working group was really to um, develop new connections and create new research directions. Um, again, Jeff and Michael's work is a great example of this, but we wanted to catalyze more. Another aim of HAI is to more quickly bring the research out of the lab into the community. And one of the ways we do that is by interfacing with policymakers. Um, an example is a congressional boot camp that we host every year. Um, last year, 25 bipartisan congressional staffers attended this boot camp and learned about all things AI applicable to their role. So we didn't really go into kind of the deep technical aspects, but more of the applications. What do they need to know when they go back to Washington? What are the impacts on education, sustainability, um, healthcare, et cetera? And we're hosting our next one this August um, with, again, the congressional staffers, but also the Congress people will be attending parts. We also have education programming for K through 12 Stanford students and executives. So AI for All is focused on high school students, increasing the diversity of um, those individuals interested in artificial intelligence. 
for Stanford students, the Stanford Symbolic Systems Human-Centered AI concentration has become one of the most popular concentrations within the most popular majors here on campus. And we also host many executives on campus with, a, with the goal to bring that cutting edge AI research to the decision makers and leaders in corporations. Um, thank you all. I look forward to further discussion. Oops. All right, great. Uh, so thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm Michael Kokinder. For I'll, I'll be talking about AI for high stakes decision making, and you'll see some natural connections to the, the research programs that, that are part of the center. Um, so th this is our lab, the Stanford Intelligent Systems Laboratory, or CISL. Uh, th these are my graduate students. And uh, we're based in the aerospace department. Uh, we, but we work on models and algorithms for decision making under uncertainty. Jeff mentioned some of the important themes that, that emerge as part of that and uh, some of the important applications. Of course, uh, aerospace depends upon the success of uh, the, this research program in order to have sustainable uh, uh, energy. So I'll, I'll start off with what is AI? And I, I really appreciate how diverse this, uh, <laughs> this audience is. Uh, but we'll, we'll start off with this def definition. This is the definition that I'm going to use. Uh, it's just a system able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. So as Vanessa mentioned, uh, this term was coined originally by John McCarthy. I knew him when I was an undergraduate here. Uh, in 1956, he proposed the, the so-called uh, Dartmouth Conference. Uh, and I'll just read to you a, a portion of the uh, proposal uh, because it highlights some of the aspects of artificial intelligence that, that are still valid today. Uh, the, the study is to proceed on the basis of the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can, in principle, be so precisely defined that a machine can be made to simulate it. An attempt will be made to find how to make machines use language, form abstractions and concepts, solve kinds of problems now reserved for humans, and improve themselves. I'm just going to read you one, one last sentence because I, I really appreciate the optimism in 1956. We think that a significant advance can be made in one or more of these problems if a carefully selected group of scientists work on it together for a summer. <laughs> All right, we have to keep in mind that uh, <laughs> one of the key ingredients to advances in AI is computation. And we have definitely benefited from Moore's law uh, over the, the past few decades. So what is, what is AI uh, really? Um, <laughs> to a lot of people, AI is just magic, right? Well, I have to admit, even though I've been working in AI for over 20 years, when I first played with ChatGPT, it felt like magic. I'm sure it felt like magic to, to you as well. And in order to solve mineral exploration, we need some magic too. So how about we just bring that magic in, in, in there? And also, I, I think in, in the Silicon Valley especially, at least up until fairly recently, if you just uttered uh, AI and incantations like PyTorch and TensorFlow, it'll magically make money appear. Uh, but <laughs> what is AI? Uh, it has really captured our, our imaginations, and rightfully so, because uh, many things that, that were previously impossible uh, are, are now possible. Uh, so what is it really? It's really just optimization. So many of you have seen uh, optimization probably in school. The, the basic idea uh, boils down to this. So the horizontal axis is x. I'm not going to show you any equations in, in this uh, talk, by the way. Um, but I'll use that one variable. And then uh, f of x is a function. And we just want to find the lowest point. We want to find the minimum of that function. That's it. That's what optimization is. But it's, it can be very, very challenging uh, for a number of reasons. One is the, the optimization landscape, that curve, can be uh, very wavy uh, with lots of so-called local optima. So one of the standard approaches for doing optimization is to basically roll, that, uh, roll a ball down the hill to find the, the minimum. If there are a lot of waves, then it can get stuck. Okay? Uh, another challenge is, 
Well, th this is just one dimension, so we can just look at it and find the, the minimum. Uh, for optimizing neural networks or, or whatever, maybe there, there are uh, maybe half a trillion dimensions, and that makes it very, very challenging. Uh, so actually, an artist tried to visualize some of the optimization landscapes for different uh, neural network functions. And uh, as you can see, the, the landscape can be very rough. So uh, I'll mention a, a few categories of uh, applications of machine learning and, and AI uh, and connect it with the idea of optimization. So much of what we want to do in AI is really just curve fitting. Okay, so we have a bunch of data points and we want to fit a curve through it. So some of you have seen linear regression. In linear regression, we just fit a, a straight line through some data points. Or if you want to get fancy, may, maybe you fit a polynomial so you can get some nice curves uh, the, through those data points. It's optimization because we want to choose the parameters in that, in that curve so that it minimizes the error of the data, data points that you have uh, collected. So for an example, let's say you have a lot of uh, data points concerning the uh, home sales. Maybe, maybe you've played with Zillow before. And uh, the, the X in this case is fairly high dimensional. Um, maybe it encompasses the, the square footage, number of bedrooms, the, the zip code, and, and so forth. And you want to make a prediction about the, the house sale. Uh, for a house that, that hasn't sold yet. That's just, uh, that's just curve fitting. Another category of application is classification. Here, you're just trying to uh, take as input, for an example, an image and classify it as either a cat or a dog. So there, what you're trying to do is optimize a decision boundary uh, in the space of possible images. Now, the space of possible images is quite vast, right? If you have a one megapixel image, it's a mi million dimensions. That's, that's the input. So you can use this for spam classification or uh, image recognition and, and so forth. Another uh, application is probability estimation. So Jeff mentioned the importance of capturing uncertainty. Well, we, we can actually frame that as an optimization problem. We're trying to change the, uh, uh, or optimize the parameters to uh, probability distribution to capture uh, roughly the data that we have observed. So this is very important if you're trying to create models of, of uh, investment returns or, or outcomes from medical treatments. So I'll run through a very brief history of AI. So remember the Dartmouth conference started in 1956. Uh, ten years later, they benefited from advances in, in computation. In 1966, we had Shaky the Robot, the first fully autonomous uh, robot. Uh, this was done by Nils Nielsen and colleagues at the Stanford Research Institute. Uh, actually, you can go and see the uh, Shaky the Robot at the uh, Computer History Museum down, down the road. Highly recommend if, if you're in town. Um, there's also the Eliza chatbot. So the Eliza chatbot is just a, it's just a collection of rules that take as input uh, the, uh, an interaction with, with a user, and it pretends to be like a Rogerian psychologist. So uh, it was pretty cool for 1966, but it, it did not have the capabilities of ChatGPT, of course. In order to uh, get to the level of ChatGPT, it needed to consume a huge amount of data, and it also needed to do a huge amount of optimization, optimizing a whole bunch of parameters in a, in a very large neural network in order to um, get the results that, that we see today. Then by the mid-1970s, there was the so-called AI winter where much of the uh, government funding dried up. Uh, then by the 1980s, businesses started to realize the potential for AI in making business decisions. And this led to the creation of so-called expert systems. But unfortunately, these expert systems tended to be quite brittle. They did not handle uncertainty very well. Uncertainty is going to be a theme that, that will be coming up uh, throughout this, uh, this symposium. 
Uh, then in 1997, there, there was a major breakthrough. So people would often say, we, we, would know if, uh, we would know that we have artificial intelligence if blank happens. And one of those blanks was, beat the, the world's greatest chess master. And uh, at that time, it was Gary Kasparov. Uh, actually, I played Gary Kasparov a, a couple of years ago. Uh, in Munich, and he defeated me. But any of my PhD students uh, could use our textbook and implement that algorithm and, uh, and beat him. Uh, so unfortunately, or the, the general assessment was that, well, it wasn't really AI. It's just that IBM's machine was able to evaluate a huge number of, of board positions. Then in 2012, there, there was AlexNet. AlexNet was a neural network that could provide human competitive object recognition. And this is something that, that back when I was an undergraduate, I thought would just be basically impossible. OK, so uh, I'll outline some of the standard models that we use for decision making under uncertainty. Uh, Jeff mentioned uh, the, the POMDP, but before I talk about the POMDP, I want to first introduce the Markov decision process, or MDP. Uh, MDPs have been around since at least the 1950s with the work of Richard Bellman. The idea is really simple. Uh, it really ought to be taught in elementary school. So here we have a set of states. Uh, so one, two, and three. A state just captures the snapshot of the true state of the world. Okay, so if you're working on a subsurface application, maybe it's exactly what's going on in the subsurface. Or if you're trying to uh, build an autonomous car, maybe it's the positions and velocities of the vehicles and the pedestrians. So for most interesting problems, you need a very large number of states. So given uh, our current state, we have different actions available to us. In an automated driving, maybe it's turn left or turn right. And uh, we then transition to some new state according to some probability distribution. So in, in this example, if we're in state two, take action A, we transition to state one with probability 0.6, or we just stay in state two with probability 0.4. And as we make these transitions, we get rewards or penalties. If we're building an aircraft collision avoidance system, maybe we get a very large penalty for colliding uh, and very small penalties for unnecessary deviations. OK, so that's the Markov decision process. There's a generalization known as the partially observable Markov decision process, or POMDP. And this captures a very important aspect that's, that's relevant to the, the problems discussed in this symposium, which is state uncertainty. OK, we don't get to directly observe the, the true state of the, the world. Instead, we use Bayesian methods to infer a probability distribution over that underlying state. But otherwise, the problem is exactly the same. You want to choose your actions wisely so that you maximize your accumulation of reward over time. Okay. Uh, th there's another model known as uh, reinforcement learning. It's just like a, an MDP or a POMDP, but you don't know those transition probabilities ahead of time, and you might not even know the rewards. Uh, but you have to interact with the world in order to figure out how it works. But the objective is still the same. Uh, maximize your expected accumulation of reward over time. So um, we, we, we've been taking that general mathematical framework and uh, we've applied it to a number of different domains. Uh, since we're in, in aerospace, naturally uh, many of them are in, uh, in aviation and, and space. This paper just came out at, um, at a robotics conference. We're collaborating with NASA Ames, uh, actually just down the street, on the Viper uh, mission. So Viper is part of the, the Artemis series of, of missions. And uh, we have a vehicle. It's equipped with a, a drill, a mass spectrometer. It has uh, radar capabilities uh, as well. And what it needs to do is plan out its path uh, figure out what information it needs to gather. Um, uh, the information may pertain to uh, scientific value. It also has constraints on that path. 
It also needs to arrive at a destination at, at a particular point in time. So you can take this problem and fr frame it as a POMDP, and then we can use a, a number of different algorithms in order to, to solve it. Uh, we've also had collaborations with uh, the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Uh, we collaborated with them on the DARPA Subterranean Challenge, uh, where we had a fleet of robots and they needed to explore these underground tunnels. Um, probably the, the fastest growing area uh, within our lab are applications to sustainability and particular to subsurface applications. We're really drawn to this rich area because not, not just for the, the really important you know, hum humanitarian applications uh, as was outlined earlier, but they're just really, uh, they're a really rich set of, of problems for extending the mathematics and computation that, that excite my students. Uh, so we, we've been looking at uh, subsurface re remediation. I think all of this is in collaboration with, with Jeff. Uh, carbon capture and, uh, and storage, geothermal energy, uh, sub, uh, subsurface storage, uh, including hydrogen. So the, there are a number of challenges with these subsurface applications. Uh, the first one is that it's very high dimensional. So the, the state space is very high dimensional and there is a, a lot of uncertainty, okay? Uh, we have many different actions available to us. Um, maybe the, there, there could be like a combinatorial explosion of possible locations to, uh, to place drills. Uh, we have to take in information from uh, multiple different sources, maybe different kinds of um, modalities. And we also have competing objectives. Uh, we have uh, safety, uh, expected return on investment, and, and so forth. And as Jeff mentioned, a key component of this is decision making in a sequential context o over a longer time horizon. Uh, much, maybe about 95% of the work on artificial intelligence is focused on single shot decisions, maybe a single prediction, like a classification or, or, a, or, a, or a prediction. So here's an example of a carbon storage formulation. Uh, you have to define your, your action space. So here we, we need to figure out where to place uh, three injectors and a monitoring well. Uh, we have to choose a solver. So not only do we have to specify the, the problem, but we need to go about actually solving that problem. And uh, I'll get to uh, a few different uh, uh, algorithms for, for doing that shortly. Uh, so one of them is called POMCPAL, which was developed in, in uh, our lab. We have to define the, the reward. Uh, so many of the problems that we're interested in in engineering involve a, a trade-off. Um, so in aviation, it's, it's a trade-off between safety and efficiency. But we need to capture our, our beliefs, um, and we need to be able to model our observations and how those observations impact our understanding of, of the subsurface. So one of the standard methods is to use what's known as Monte Carlo tree search. Monte Carlo tree search is a fairly simple idea. It's the, the high level concept is summarized in this slide. It's ba basically four steps that are repeated over and over. It did not really gain popularity until 2006 when it was first applied to Go, uh, which is a, a board game. So back when I was an undergraduate, I, I took uh, AI, I, I think it was in 1999 or, or 2000. Uh, although we were able to build computers that could beat uh, the, the greatest chess player, uh, it seemed like Go was just still so far off, or, or maybe not even feasible with, within my lifetime. And the, the reason for that is you can't brute force it like you can to some extent with chess. So uh, it became popular, so Monte Carlo Tree Search became popular in 2006, and then later on it was used to uh, beat the, the greatest chess play, uh, greatest Go player in um, uh, 2016. 
So uh, th this is one of the headlines. You can, you can see the, the basic idea of the algorithm. It reasons about future trajectories, okay? It reasons deeper in areas that appear to be more promising. But you don't really know what areas are going to be promising in, until you start exploring them, okay? And all of this exploration is being done in computation. So it does all of this re reasoning, and then it comes up with the best possible next step. It executes that next step, and then it goes through all of that reasoning again. And this is a, a key idea that, that we have built upon in our lab. Actually, you can see one of the posters back there uh, titled Beta Zero, and uh, what we've been using this for subsurface applications. So we wanted to make it really easy for people from a variety of different backgrounds to take their, their problems, whether they be in, um, in sustainability or medicine, frame it as a POMDP, and then apply a, a variety of different solvers to, to come up with the optimal decision-making strategy. So we did this in the Julia programming language. Many of you might be wondering why didn't we do it in Python, but it turns out that for these fairly complicated POMDP algorithms. There are a lot of loops and branching, and Python's not very good at that. So we use the, the Julia programming language. We open source this. Uh, there, there are tutorials online. Uh, the, the appropriate solver depends uh, tremendously on the characteristics of the problem. So for many of our problems, they're, they're, the action space might be extremely large. So you might want to choose uh, one kind of solver over another. Uh, we've also created a uh, tutorial on pomdps.jl. Um, my student, Robert Moss, who has been collaborating with Jeff for the past few years. This is available for free online. I also teach a, a quarter-long course through Stanford, the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Um, it will next be offered in the fall. So uh, <laughs> I hope I've convinced you that POMDPs are, are very exciting and applicable to what you care about. But just for fun, uh, it hasn't really picked us up as uh, much traction compared to deep learning. Um, th this is just the, the Google Ngram viewer. It's kind of still at a flat line here, but deep learning has really taken off. I'm a little bit confused about what was going on in the early 1800s with, with deep learning, but <laughs> hopefully it, it, it will catch on. In order to facilitate that, uh, I've worked with my former PhD student, Tim Wheeler, and my collaborator, Kyle Ray, on this textbook, Algorithms for Decision Making. This textbook is used in my course uh, offered in the fall. It takes you through the, the general theory of uh, POMDPs, uh, Bayesian networks, uh, talks about Bayesian inference, which is a, a key ingredient here, uh, multi-agent systems, uh, handling state uncertainty, and, and so forth. And you can download it for free at algorithmsbook.com. It, it'll take you through <laughs> POMDP land. So uh, although the, it's very easy to specify a problem as a POMDP, the, the space of possible solution methods is actually quite vast. And uh, many of these methods have been explored in very different communities. And what we've tried to do with this textbook is to unify them in, into a, a common language and, and conceptual framework. Uh, we've also released a, a couple other books, uh, Decision Making Under Uncertainty Theory and Application. This is a provides a higher level overview, does not quite go in uh, as much depth, uh, but it's, it's uh, accessible to a more uh, broader audience. You can download actually both of these for free. And as I mentioned, underlying AI is optimization, so we wrote a, a book specifically on that. I'll very briefly mention a, an application to aircraft collision avoidance. Uh, just to demonstrate that POMDP is a, it's not just for, for toy problems, it's for real problems. Uh, so in, uh, I started working in this area 
uh, back when I was at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, uh, taking the problem of aircraft collision avoidance and framing it as, as a POMDP. The, the basic idea for this collision avoidance uh, framework was released in 2011, but it, was, it didn't become an international standard until 2018 with the RTCA standard DO 385. So it was accepted then as uh, a standard for use on every large transport, in, uh, transport aircraft in the world. So uh, that's a number of years, right? Uh, a lot of effort had to go into the verification and validation of this methodology. But the good news is that you can benefit from the, the work we did. Uh, Anthony and, and many of my other students helped create general purpose tools that can also be applied to validating decision strategies for uh, mineral exploration. And what you have to think about for your problem, what makes it hard? For aircraft collision avoidance, it's hard because of state uncertainty. You have imperfect sensor information. There's dynamic uncertainty. Most of the time, aircraft fly straight, but sometimes they turn left or turn right or, or whatever. And you also have multiple competing objectives. You want to be extremely safe without alerting too often, right? You, you also don't want to have a, a system that just tells you to land as soon as you encounter another aircraft. You can make yourself arbitrarily safe, but no one would actually use that system. And inherent in mining is the trade-off between uh, the risk and your expected return. So uh, as I mentioned in 2018, it became a standard for every large transport aircraft. In 2020, it became a standard for large unmanned aircraft, 2022 for small unmanned aircraft, and in 2025, the community is, is working on a standard for rotocraft and uh, advanced air mobility concepts. So I'll wrap up here with a, a few key takeaways. The first one is, I hope I've convinced you that uh, optimization is at the heart of artificial intelligence. This, this is what creates the magic of chat GPT. This is the magic behind uh, ACASX. Uh, the partially observable Markov decision process, it's a very powerful abstraction. I think it's, honestly, it's one of the most important abstractions uh, ever, <laughs> um, because it's, it's very generally applicable. And what I found in teaching my classes is once, once the students understand that, ab uh, that abstraction, the components of it, the observation space, the action space, uh, the, the reward model, they can then, it opens up a, a lot of opportunities across a variety of domains, uh, ranging from uh, medicine to uh, robotics. Uh, the last point is really, very important. Uh, rigorous system validation is necessary prior to deployment. We, we have experience with, with that with, with aircraft collision avoidance. We needed to build uh, consensus, not just within the technical community that this was the right way to go, but uh, we needed to build consensus in the international safety uh, community in, in order for it to be deployed and have the impact that we were hoping for. Uh, with that, uh, shall I hand it over to John? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Michael. And so now we have John. Uh, so John is a former student of Michael and got to know John uh, through the, the grant. Uh, and so for that reason, I have to embarrass you. <laughs> <laughs> you are officially <laughs> Mineral X heroes. One. Michael and Vanessa, yeah. Okay, we need a photo with that, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right, so uh, I think one of the great things about being at Stanford is this, uh, you know, this really, and particularly in engineering, is this really close collaboration with industry. I've actually several, one student here uh, of mine that I've worked, uh, is working in the oil and gas industry, and so here now we have 
John working in the mineral uh, space. So John is going to tell you what happened between his PhD, <laughs> which is not that long ago, and, uh, and today. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I also want to say I'm impressed. We got to the third session of an AI conference without mentioning ChatGPT, so well done. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk today about um, taking AI research that I did with Jeff and Michael and bringing it into practice at Kobold. So the story starts in 2019. Uh, it was about halfway through my PhD when we started to look at how to apply intelligent decision-making methodologies, POMDPs, to geoscience applications. So we looked at wind farms, we looked at reservoirs, aquifers, and in late 2020, we started looking at mineral exploration. Um, at the end of my PhD in late 2021, uh, Jeff and I had completed kind of our preliminary research into this space. We were preparing a paper for publication, and it's at that point that I met Kobold and joined Kobolds about two months later. Um, flash forward about a year, and we had taken that preliminary research and matured it in Kobold to the point where we actually have an operational drill program, which Jeff showed you some videos of before, actively targeting drill rigs in Southern Africa. So the research that Jeff and I did focused on answering the question of how we can formulate mineral exploration as an intelligent decision process and how we can solve them and what the benefits would be. So really we looked at how we can fit um, mineral exploration tasks into this type of framework. Now this is not a unique framework we invented. This is uh, a way you can view almost every intelligent decision-making problem, every autonomous system from video games to robotics to mineral exploration. Um, they all kind of follow this canonical loop. Uh, the, the three main components here, uh, starting at the left, are your world model. This is the internal conceptualization that your intelligent agent has about the important parts of its world or its environment. You have an action solver that is how the agent decides, given that world model, what the best action to take is in order to achieve its goal. And then once you take your action, you observe some information, you have a filter. And this filter tells you how to take that newly observed data and update and improve your world model. So it's these three pieces operating in this closed loop fashion, this dynamically adaptable fashion, that allow intelligent agents to achieve state-of-the-art performance on so many tasks. So when we looked at how to apply mineral exploration to this framework, Really, the tasks aren't that different than what you might find in a conventional exploration program. We have to model geology, we have to plan our measurement campaign, and we have to update and interpret our data. So we weren't really able, though, to, that's kind of where the similarities stop. We weren't able to take the conventional approaches and plug them into this framework. We had to do things a little differently so that we could uh, adapt these different uh, steps of the exploration process to a quantitative and, and statistically robust framework. So for modeling geology, that becomes modeling geology with uncertainty. So Kurt already touched on this when he talked about uh, stochastic inversion. I believe Jeff also had some examples. We're not interested in taking a single guess of what's under the subsurface anymore, right? The name of the game in mineral exploration is understanding and reducing uncertainty. So our models that we start with is the input to our system have to rigorously capture what we know and what we don't know and where. Planning our measurements, we're moving away from static, uh, you know, fixed exploration plans and fixed measures of experiments and moving toward dynamic and future-looking solvers that plan sequentially using methods like tree search, which Michael already talked about. This is really going to speed up my talk. Thank you, guys. And finally, when we interpret our data, um, it's important that we're able to interpret the data and all the things we get from drill cores and geophysical surveys and feed it back into our uncertainty model and be able to update what we think we know what we think the uncertainty is based on everything that we see when we take our measurements. And in doing so, we're able to adapt our uh, ensemble of models. So this is kind of like what, what was shown before with the stochastic inversion. We start out with a collection of tens of thousands of feasible realizations of what might be in the subsurface. And by, in this case, simulating uh, drilling, uh, drilling drill core samples, we're able to slowly reduce our uncertainty up to the point where we get a really clear picture of what's there. So we did this, we actually implemented this for a synthetic case of a subsurface exploration program. And what we found was that by adapting dynamically and rigorously tracking your uncertainty, you're able to greatly increase the efficacy of your exploration. You can actually cut in this synthetic case your exploration time roughly in half. So that's, that's where we ended off our research. At this point, late 2020, we had Start, uh, late 2021, excuse me, we had started to prepare this research for publication. So I'm done, right? My job at Cobalt's super easy. Uh, unfortunately not. 
This was, to our knowledge, the first rigorous application of POMDPs and in intelligent decision making toward the mineral exploration task. So our job really was to just understand the limits of the state of the art and to apply the best solutions that were already available. So when we did this, we, we started by chopping up our large mineral exploration challenge into those canonical tasks of data modeling and filtering, and then looked at each of those tasks one by one. And when we did so, we found that in order to make the state of the art work, we often had to limit the scope. We had to make some assumptions, right? We might have a method that models geology really well, except for faults. So let's just assume for this problem there's no faults. It's really easy to do this work if you can make those assumptions. Um, you do this over and over again, and you end up with a system that works. It demonstrates the feasibility of the concepts you're demonstrating, but in the real world, when you try to apply it to an you know, exploration target in, in Zambia, for example, you can't make those assumptions. You have gaps that you have to fill, and you have a larger scope of problem that you have to be able to address. So the majority of my work at Cobold for the last year and a half or so has been focused on figuring out how to best fill those gaps, often in a case-by-case -case scenario, looking to the vast array of AI and, and applied statistics literature to find the best solutions that can help us bridge the gap between where this current state of the art and research is and what we actually need to be able to do today. So what, what are, oops, sorry. What are those gaps, right? I think, roughly speaking, there are three major types of gaps that we have commanded the majority of my time to fill. And these are gaps that I think will be repeatable as we look to imply these types of AI methods into other uh, geological domains and other geoscience problems. The first area is communication and trust. So this part of this is just kind of the inherent cultural challenges you have when two new disciplines start to work together for the first time, right? You have to develop a shared language, a shared understanding of each other's values and so on. But there's also a technological uh, challenge here as well. And that challenge is that a lot of the most performant state-of-the-art methods in decision-making, uh, deep reinforcement learning, you know, really large-scale Monte Carlo tree search, are effectively black boxes, right? They're systems that are so complex in the way they're doing the reasoning and search that it's hard to interrogate what's actually happening, right? Why did this input result in this targeting recommendation? So a lot of the work that we've had to do has focused on developing ways to run these solvers and ways to formulate our problems so that we get not just a blind recommendation of, hey, you should drill here, but rather a map or other artifacts that allow us to interpret why that recommendation is being made, what happens if we were to target somewhere else, how robust is this solution, and how can I implement this under realistic logistical constraints? Number two is, is expert integration, right? This is not, by comparison to image classification or large language models, a big data domain. We cannot rely solely on data sources and large open source you know, corpuses of data to do the work for us. We need to take advantage of the expertise that geologists and geoscientists and other explorationists have developed over decades of experience and incorporate that into models. So the challenge here is that a lot of that expertise is qualitative. We have a group of our community of people that are used to communicating ideas with sketches like this, with uh, descriptions that are qualitative and hard to represent in computational formats. So a lot of the work has been, again, bridging that communication gap, being able to develop a, a rapport so that we can understand how to model the intuition that our experts have in quantitative terms and to develop hypotheses and models that are able to both satisfy the underlying geological hypotheses that we're trying to model and also be computationally tractable and usable in this decision-making framework. And finally, there is a, a, a scale and scope problem. So a lot of the methodologies that we use, Monte Carlo tree search being a good example, are de were developed in the realm of robotics and game playing, where our action space, or our, our spaces can be large, but if you consider, for example, the number of degrees of freedom of a, of a moderately high fidelity aircraft simulator, for example, right? You might have a few dozen degrees of freedom. You compare that to a subsurface model, a voxel model of the subsurface, where you're going to have tens of thousands to millions of parameters, right? The scope of the computation that you need to do in order to accommodate this much larger space and this much larger uh, amount of uncertainty is significant. And this goes beyond just, so addressing this goes beyond just scaling up computational resources and parallelizing and putting stuff on clusters, right? There is algorithmic innovation that's required here. There are trades that need to be made between uh, sample efficiency of a solver designed to control a robotic manipulator uh, to maybe make it be able to be more parallelizable to address these large geological problems. 
So I'll, I'll leave off with where we are today. Um, this has been alluded to a few times, but um, earlier this year, we started drilling on a large project in Zambia. We are, have, we are in our optimization problem, considering um, where to target drills over a five kilometer squared area. We've got multiple years that, in which we're trying to forecast out in the future to target these drills. We've got five active rigs running, all with a whole assortment of logistical and then operational constraints and challenges. And we've got a lot of different geological hypotheses we're trying to track and, ac and account for that are constantly evolving during the execution of this campaign. Uh, despite all those challenges, over after about a year of work, we were able to start drilling on our first hole, um, which we have, actually, I don't know if this is the first here, but one of our drill rigs uh, that's currently operating today shown, shown here. Um, so this is only the start, right? There's a lot of work that can be done. There's a lot more work that should be done to do all the things that Michael referenced in, in helping to verify robustness and accountability. There's a lot more performance we can get. There's a lot more we can do to build up that communication and trust. But I think this is good, good progress that shows that, that we can actually benefit from implementing these methods in a real world, messy, challenging problem like, like this, this exploration program. And I, I think, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. All right, okay, so uh, we'll take some time to have a, a little panel questions discussion and then please afterwards, uh, if you could go to the, uh, the microphone. Uh, I'll start with you, uh, Vanessa. Um, if you looked at your slides and uh, I saw sustainability and earth were still very small relative to medical and, and, and other things. And, so the question maybe one is why is that and, and how is human-centered AI looking at improving that? Yeah, um, well, for one, that those, the School of Medicine here at Stanford School of Engineering is quite large, so yeah. that's one factor. But we do still agree that we need to catalyze more work kind of at that mm. intersection of yeah. AI and Earth and, yeah. and some of the other departments within the School of Sustainability. And that is one of the reasons we started that sustainability working group was because we, through our, you know, our call for proposals, we just weren't seeing very many projects coming through um, yeah. and wanted to try to do what we can to increase connections and, and um, jumpstart some, some new projects and proposals. Yeah. So are there particular companies or entities that uh, the human-centered uh, AI works with and perhaps are you looking at different funding models uh, for that? Uh, we are looking at different funding models. I would say right now we're really uh, faculty focused. So the faculty yeah. like you and, and Michael and some of the others um, who are who have those connections? We're trying to help um, your organizations yeah. kind of grow, but yeah, we're always open to like kind of new ideas, new partnerships, etc. Especially um, within sustainability, we have heard from a lot of kind of our advisors and community members that there is a big need for an opportunity for AI to support yeah. sustainability challenges. Yeah. So, following up on that, Michael. Um, how do you work with industry partners? And uh, you have a lot of experience, so um, this kind of transition that we see that John had into the real world, I mean, it's just one example, but w what are your principles that you use there in, in, your, in your group? Yeah, well, we've had a number of really great uh, long-term sponsors uh, just through direct uh, interactions, um, as well as through the Stanford Center for AI Safety. Anthony Corso is the executive director of that uh, center. Uh, how, do we, how do we choose who we collaborate with? Well, my, my students, of course, they have to write a lot of papers and they have a thesis, uh, a PhD thesis to write in the end. Um, and so they have to advance the, uh, the state of the art uh, a requirement for the PhD is to advance human understanding, and, and so we have that constraint, but the, the great news is that uh, we have a lot of partners who are working on real-world applications that can really validate whether the theory we're coming up with is actually useful. So my, my students, of course, they enjoy writing papers and especially presenting them in Hawaii and other, <laughs> other places like that, but they, um, 
what, what drives them is really having a positive benefit to society. Yeah. And uh, our, our partners help us do that. So I always found that one of the uh, challenges is, and certainly you, you alluded to that, it's easy for a student to say, oh, I got a problem. Let's go on MATLAB. I can do deep learning. And it's like almost like one line of command. And that's why you got your curve there, right? And so, so you mentioned the, uh, the software part. Um, what are the main challenges there? What are the, the hurdles people have? Because it seems in your case, it is very specialized and it's not black box. Uh, type of, right? And I love that it's a formulation and then there are algorithms. Um, so could you talk a little bit about the challenges that you see or you're having in, in, in uh, getting people to use the software? Yes, uh, so the, there are a few different challenges. I, I think one of the most fundamental challenge in our area of research is scalability. And actually that's one of the th aspects that drew me to, to your line yeah. of work because Scalability, it's all about scalability. You're working with very high dimensional problems. And so uh, that's fundamental. What we're trying to, the, the way to make algorithms scalable is to take advantage of the structure inherent to the problem. And when we go about selecting problems, we want to choose problems that uh, if solved would solve a number of different related problems, not just for the one particular application yeah. that, that we're working with our partner on. And so the, the challenge is to really figure out what is the right level of abstraction so that we yeah. don't build just a, a black box for this one thing. Yeah, yeah thanks. So, so John then, uh, you, you took your, your prototype code uh, to COBOLD and, and then sort of the question is always, do you stay with the general framework or do you go very specific and, and what are, because, because the formulation is just about drilling, it's also about acquiring geophysics, et cetera. Is, can you talk a little about the challenges of going from this general prototype to a specific implementation for Zambia? Yeah, um, so I'd say we, we, my personal philosophy is to try to create code that's repeatable as much as possible. You know, there, there are going to be times where you have to make specific modeling choices for the Zambia project, for example. Um, but almost everything I've written at COBOLD has been written to be extensible to many projects. Right? We have a lot of different targets. We have a lot of different prospects we're trying to explore. And it wouldn't make sense. We wouldn't be able to scale up from the human side of things the deployment of these tools if we had to rewrite a new solver every time. These solvers are really complex. The modeling challenges are all very difficult to do well. Um, so if we can write something that is reusable and extensible, um, we do it. Um, and the way I, you know, to get in the weeds, the way I do this is by writing kind of like template code and, and repeating that over and, and, and pulling pieces that are reusable. But um, yeah, I, I think try, I would say my, my rule of thumb has been to try to make it as general as possible until I can't anymore, until it's just not worth, you know, not worth the effort to try to, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna degrade the solution for your specific yeah. case if you try to, to try to make it general beyond a certain point. But even within COBOLD, you know, we want these tools to be, be able to be deployed as quickly and as, as far reaching as possible. So that's still been the philosophy. Yeah. So you mentioned some of the challenges. Um, you know, mining industry is a very traditional industry uh, and, and can you, Talk a little bit about perhaps the apprehension people have in, in the AI making a decision that looks really counterintuitive to a, geological, a geologist making a decision. Have you been in those kind of circumstances? Yeah, well, I'll say mining in general probably is very conservative. Cobalt is not, which is, which is very fortunate. Right? We have um, a healthy dose of um, caution and, and, and healthy conservatism when it comes to making really important and potentially dangerous decisions. You know, and we always put safety and other things first. But with regards to technical innovation, we, you know, we lean into it pretty hard. Um, but you know, we, within our teams, within our exploration teams for specific projects, absolutely, we've encountered those situations where you know, a targeting support tool will say target here, and, and all the geologist intuition will taste, say target somewhere else. And in some cases, it's that our initial model was incomplete. We didn't consider some factor in the model that, that should have been there. And the geologist's intuition is the correct way to go. In other cases, it's been 
a learning experience, right? We've had to, we've done, one thing that's been very helpful has been doing kind of what if for gaming, so to speak, right? See what happens if we can do here. And, and the beauty of these tools is that you're building simulators. So you can simulate what happens if we drill here versus here and where does it go next and how does our uncertainty evolve? And we can watch kind of how the uncertainty and the posteriors, right? We've all learned that today, um, change over time. So it's been really good to have, an, I think, Barring a technical innovation, it's just been having a back and forth rapport with the rest of the exploration team to understand when those divergences happen. Yeah, thanks. Um, Scott, moving back to, to Michael, um, you, mo you had the, uh, uh, the magic pictures on. Uh, <laughs> and uh, whenever students of yours come in my office, they say, Michael really wants to talk about interpretable AI. Yeah. So mm -hmm. what does that even mean? Right. So. <laughs> That, that's, a, that's a great question because for, for many important problems, it's, it can be very challenging to find the right level of explanation, right? So you can actually get pretty far using, uh, in physics, just using Newtonian physics, even though we know it's a complete lie. Um, but it's the right level of abstraction to make good predictions and to get some kind of intuition of what's going on. So in AI, a, a very important emerging area is explainability. Uh, it, it's, it was so important that actually last summer, uh, the Stanford Center for AI Safety hosted a tutorial on explainability, and uh, that's actually publicly uh, available. Um, it is incredibly important as we are trying to build trust in these systems as they're deployed in the real world, whether they're flying our aircraft or making our medical decisions or trading our, our money and, and, and so forth. Um, the full explanation might not be the, the right one. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, so Vanessa, uh, one of the, the challenges in our industry is, is attracting young people mm -hmm. uh, and um, could you say a little bit about the role of your center in um, recruiting perhaps students or, or young, uh, young folks who are not traditionally in artificial intelligence or not traditionally engineering or, or computer science? How, how does the center see that role? Yeah, um, we think it's very important. Um, I mean, one of the big goals and, and mission of HAI is that these problems are too difficult to solve just by the computer scientist in their office. Um, and so we, it's critical to bring in those other disciplines. Um, we have a few different types of programming. Uh, we have student groups where students can kind of collate around a particular topic of interest. Um, and we require, and we provide them a little bit of support, and we require those student groups to be interdisciplinary. So um, we don't really want just the computer scientists. We want them, if they're thinking about sustainability applications, bring in people from from Earth and, yeah. and other areas. You can't um, solve the problem with just one person. Um, and then we also do uh, fellowships. Okay. So. Um, sponsoring students who are interested in um, perhaps a different discipline, but the applications of AI on that discipline, and then they can really, um, we also have computer scientists in that cohort, and they can kind of um, intermingle their, their expertise and, and learn from each other to yeah. further both of their areas. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So, so Michael, also for you, uh, you've a big, had a big group around uh, the self-driving cars and, and those kind of applications. Um, and it, it attracts uh, robotics and, and it attracts a lot of people. How do we attract more people to apply to, to these kind of, I mean, this energy transition and uh, solving the world, <laughs> saving the world kind of problems? Actually, uh, probably the most convincing way is to uh, send them a link to your HAI talk <laughs> because oh, you make okay. a super strong case for the, the importance of, yeah. of this. Yeah. Um, I also highlight it in my introductory um, courses as well. Um, I think uh, it's, it's a, an easy case to make, right? Yeah. If, if it's a very easy case to make nowadays. So a final question for John, and before we go to the, uh, the audience for if there are any questions. Uh, 
John, same kind of question is, is if, if you're a young person um, starting in computer science, how, how do you get hired by Cobalt? <laughs> what do you, oh, what do you would say to a young person today of how to get hired by Cobalt or any other company that, work, that uses uh, artificial intelligence in, in, in mining? Um, I'll say, you know, anybody that's getting into STEM, I think, has an inherent desire to make a positive impact. Um, so I think that uh, you know, as we, and, and I think everybody, for the most part, recognizes the importance of the energy transition and, and, and addressing climate change. I think the important thing to communicate is that you can make an impact as a computer scientist student, right? Like, it's not obvious, I think, for a lot of people that as somebody that's studying AI, what, how do I apply this to climate change? How do I apply this to solving these big kind of global scale problems? Um, so I would say my advice if you want to get into the space is to uh, first believe that you can make a difference, right? There's a lot of, as, as Kurt and you and everybody else said, there's a lot we need to do and there's not a lot of resources to do it. And I think that that is the crux of the impact that AI can make in this space is maximizing the impact of the, the exploration budgets and the, the mineral resources themselves and all these other things. And, and understanding that that impact is something that you can contribute to as a student, I would, I would, I would stress. And then I would say study, study the problem, right? I think that there's a lot of um, research out there and there's a lot, of, a lot of ways you can study particular algorithms or particular uh, methodologies. Um, begin to focus on the problems that are present in the field and understand where the limits of the state of the art are now, right? You don't want to put the solution first. You want to really spend a lot of time thinking about where the gaps are and, and try to fill those. Um, and, and if you do that, you know, that's, that's absolutely something any company would, would, want to, would want to try to snatch up. So that's my advice. Thanks. All right, so any, any questions here from then open it up now to the audience and uh, please, there's uh, the microphone on the left and the right. You can go line up behind the microphone. Uh, they're over there. Uh, so any questions for either this panel, also general in AI and mineral exploration for Kurt uh, or others, uh, happy to, to get that. So I see uh, a number of persons over there. So maybe we can start. Are you going, Timmy? Yeah. yeah. Hello, Timmy, Louis, student, Stanford. Uh, my question is mostly I wanted to hear a little bit of discussion on how once you go from like the lab to mine, also the ethical implications become a lot more real. When you're playing with the toy cases, it can be like, oh, computer. And then you go into <laughs> real world. So I just wanted to hear some discussion on that part of the transition. Do you want to take that? Uh, yeah, I'll, st I'll start with that. I think that this this is beyond a technical problem, right? This is this has to do with the culture of the company you work for. So making sure you have good engagement before you start a project with the local communities and all your stakeholders, making sure that every discussion, ethics, and safety, and things like that are not just present but emphasized and at the forefront. Because um, the reality is, yeah, our, our computer simulations are only going to be able to handle so much. They're not going to. We might not have the foresight or the ability to compute the, the environmental impact of a, of a of, or the logistical impact of a, of a drill rig that might intersect a local road. So we want to have people on the ground that engage with the communities directly to understand everything and then don't trust the computers blindly, right? Like that's the whole, whole point of having a human in the loop here is that we're not doing decision making, we're doing decision support. So always kind of keeping that awareness that these solutions are not holistic as much as we'd like them to be and, and always defer to your priorities and your priority should always have ethics as, as the first priority. Thank you. Hi, that was fantastic. I have a couple of questions when it comes to minerals. How much are you also looking inside a lab through a syn bio process of creating new novel materials that can be sustainable, not only extracting uh, from the the Earth's core. And the second question is, from an AI standpoint, how do you approach the multi-agent environment and the optimization part of the, the modeling parts? Thank so, you. Yeah, so the, the very good question. So absolutely substitution of, of materials is, is absolutely important. And actually, here at Stanford, we're doing a lot of material science research. And uh, Jimmy Chen uh, is here to talk to you more about that. So we are looking very actively also on, on waste and 
uh, and what we can extract to waste. And, and this afternoon, Doug Wicks will talk a little bit about that. So absolutely all of those things. Uh, however, the, the, the predictions are, as you saw this morning, so everything we can cut off those predictions absolutely uh, need to do that. Uh, and then maybe a question about the multi-agent. Do you want to take that? Yeah, the, the multi-agent part is, is very important. Actually, it's the, the last part of that, that new textbook. Uh, I think we have four or five chapters just on that subject. And uh, many of the key ideas have been emerging in uh, many different communities, including uh, robotics, uh, in aerospace where, where you have to coordinate between multiple vehicles, uh, but also economics, right? Uh, so th these, these ideas we try to frame in, in a general purpose framework. It's really important to be able to account for uncertainty in the interaction of the other agents. So w one of the aspects that, that really got me excited about the human-centered AI Institute here at Stanford is the, the need to model human agents and the interaction of those human agents and the uncertainty that's inherent in that. That's absolutely critical to, to model and we've been developing algorithms in order to um, make scalable solution methods. Thank you. Thank you. Michael? Yeah. yeah. Mike Daly from uh, Oxford Earth Sciences, uh, UK. So thank you for a tremendous uh, session. Uh, my question is, is to do with actually building on Kurt's point about the fact that 200 meters below the Earth is where the future is, uh, in much of this mineral space. Um, once you do that, you're no longer dealing with rock that we can see and hold and study. We're dealing with sort of indirect data. We're dealing with um, seismic data that gives you an acoustic velocity. You're dealing with gravity that gives you density and so on. How, how does that work into your modeling? Because I noticed it was always theme delivered in, in, the, in the cartoons that you showed as you're thinking about it. But as we go forward, the biggest issue, and I have a big background in um, uh, the oil industry and how we use different levels of data, which is all indirect. But we're never, we've never been very good at integrating that, at really understanding the power of putting that together. I, I would be interested in how you're going down that line. I, I can start. So I think the Bayesian framework that we use lends itself really well to fusion of multiple data sources um, without getting too far into the details of saying we, we rely a lot on forward simulation and then backward statistical calculation to do the inversions that we said, right? The, the basic framework is for any piece of data that we have, we, want to, we start with a very broad prior set of all feasible models of the subsurface. And all feasible models in and of itself is unachievable, but a broad set of, of examples that are feasible. And we kind of down-select those based on whatever data that we have available using a Bayesian inversion method. And that inversion method, the math that goes into that, is agnostic to this type of the physical modality of the data. Uh, some of it will constrain certain dimensions better than others. Um, some of it will have little impact at all, you know, kind of counterintuitively when combined with something else that kind of shows you the same thing. Um, so doing that and implementing those is difficult. So each, each you know, different physical modality requires a lot of work to implement that inversion process. But once it's, in, once it's implemented, it can be combined in the Bayesian framework. You take your ensemble that you've parred down with your electromagnetic data, and then you pass that through another round with your uh, gravitational data or whatever, whatever else you have. And you can, get, you can start to see your picture get clearer. And what you'll see a lot of the times is a really good sense of what you should do next. Because you'll see it get really clear in one dimension, and there'll be something that, that stands out as not having been constrained by your data um, to that point. So I, I see if anybody else wants to and, add and it's on. Had, it's been a big focus of coming out, out of oil and gas. It's been a big focus of our research group is around data integration. Actually, a poster there on, in, in, in Zambia, how you can integrate geochemistry and geophysics. So you're taking it kind of like a step further. But absolutely, this is still one of the front lines of our research that needs to be done. Thank yeah. you, Michael. I wanted to thank you guys. My name is Andrew Mazel. I've just got a, a simple question for John. Um, I think a couple other people in the audience may have it as well. You had this great graph that showed that 
using your techniques, your algorithms, um, your AI, you could uh, achieve the same results with a 50% or a third less uh, number of drills, number of holes drilled. Um, then you said you drilled your first hole in February of this year. How do you know you can do it in a third less? <laughs> <laughs> Statistics is the short answer. Um, we, you know, it's, it's all, what we're optimizing over, over is the expectation, right? So there's no guarantee that the pattern that we drill will be great. We could have a very corner case, but, but the nice thing is that as we evolve our statistical understanding of what's underground, we're going to make the best decision that we can based on what we know. Uh, the graph you're referring to was, was a synthetic case, and the way we developed that was by simulating thousands and thousands of ore bodies underground and letting the algorithm run on each one of those. So it is, it is a statistical accumulation. And there may have been cases in that accumulation where a conventional static grid approach did as well or better. But in expectation, um, operating the closely way that we are, that is what the statistics tells us, tells us will, will, will occur. Um, to kind of follow up on that is yeah. uh, the, the synthetic simulations don't in, include the unknown unknowns. Yes. Because, <laughs> right? So. So maybe both for, maybe starting with you, Michael. Yeah. Uh, I had a question earlier about somebody said, what about the unknown unknowns? Uh, how, how do you see that? I mean, there's an unknown question, unknown answer. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that's super challenging. And, and I, I think the, the question is great because uh, many of the systems that we're developing, in our lab at least, they're, they're going to... <laughs> A, a big investment decision needs to be made, made before it's uh, deployed. In order to make that investment decision, you have to have a sense of how well it's going to perform. So for an example, with aircraft collision avoidance, we, didn't, we needed to estimate what's the probability of collision because it had it to be below some threshold. Of course, we can't afford to manufacture the aircraft collision avoidance system, deploy it, and wait until you know, a statistically significant number of aircraft crash. <laughs> so we don't, we don't want to do that. Um, so what we did was we collected nine months of all of the uh, FAA and Department of Defense radar data and built a, a large statistical model and ran tens of billions of simulations. Uh, so one point that I should really emphasize here is the need to validate your evaluation model yeah. and also, very critically, make sure that the, uh, the model that you use for optimizing the system is distinct and independent of the model that you use for evaluation. Yeah. So that can help reduce the, the risk of the effects of unknown unknowns yeah, and, yeah. and so forth. Yeah. I'll, I'll add one more thing too. It's, I think it's when we're deploying these systems, it's important to have um, checks in place to catch those anomalies, right? Catch, catch things where if you observe data, it can be very hard to, to know whether or not that data agrees with the kind of support of all of your systems or all your models. and, and um, having something in place that, that can flag when a piece of data is so far out of the statistical likely set that it is it kind of suggests that your model is insufficient is an important way to kind of allow a level of introspection and, and, and robustness through the kind of human process that wraps around it all. Can I make a comment? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so thinking about that too, we talked about uh, human in the loop and, and I think this, this brings up the point that we can't expect AI, while I work at Stanford's Institute for Human Centered AI, like we don't think that the AI is going to take over the full jobs of some of these people. It, it should really augment the work that you're doing. So there should be somebody, especially for critical decisions, um, who is validating those decisions, who understands what the model is doing and is able to flag when things are um, not looking quite right, which also speaks to the importance of that community engagement in developing these systems from the very start and perhaps even being part of the project team as you're building these things um, and to be able to identify kind of anomalies. Yes, question. Hey, I'm actually uh, work for an oil company, so it's kind of interesting to be here. And, um, uh, but I worked with Cobalt like it's a second mint, so I kind of know the both side of the world. What's, uh, what I want to say is like when it's a very important that we need to like collaborate and uh, be an example for next generations and everything. 
It's totally appreciated of your talk. But what I want to ask is, so say I work for BP and I work for Equinor and my main role was, say, um, you know, the risk of how much oil can I have in the reservoir. And Jeff, you showed on the top left called belief and underneath was geology. So after 10 years, I still think that gut feeling that I will have a oil there is really what it comes down to. Mm. But the bigger aspect is like uncertainty, which, you know, Michael, you mentioned. So we do a bunch of uncertainty, but still, you know, still after all these years, how many trillions of dollars have been spent and all of that, we come down to like 20% chance of success in oil and gas. How much is chance of success for mining? And your uncertainty and everything, what percentage actually makes it better? Is it like 2% to 5 versus 20% to 50%? And the last thing, maybe getting towards lunch, I, when I worked with car, you know, Cobalt, one thing always bothered me. I like to watch like, you know, Game of Thrones kind of movies or things. All I hear is like swords and metals. What were they looking? They didn't have all this fancy AI, but all the movies, all the things, they had copper, they had iron. What were they doing to find all of this so easily that we cannot? Tripping over it? <laughs> so, wow, that's a very long question. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the discovery, we know this is discovery rates are very low uh, for, for min minerals re with regard to oil and gas. And the oil and gas has the magic data that the minerals don't have, and it's called seismic, right? So the oil and gas industry has perfected seismic and, and used that. There's no very little use of gravity, EM, or so, so on. So the challenge, there's more challenge in the subsurface discovery of, of ore bodies because there are hard rocks in hard rocks. And so it just becomes a lot harder. And so therefore, as we saw this morning, because things that have been discovered, um, you're looking now at maybe 0.5% probability of success. Right? And so, so one of the things we're trying to do is move that needle even to 2% would be an amazing achievement. Uh, so the other thing, however, is that it costs less to try. Right? You have to drill very expensive exploration wells while it doesn't cost as much to try. Um, otherwise, I do see um, a lot of similarities. Um, geology is, I, I don't believe in gut feeling. I think Tversky and Kahneman made it very clear that judgment it's called judgment with heuristics. It's called gut feeling. I don't think that that works. I, I've seen that in my career, and um, and it always what it leads to is cost overrun. Your gut feeling, because it doesn't look like your gut feeling. Is there more faults than you think there are? And so, so typically you have more uh, cost overruns, and that's a big problem. I think the biggest problem I've seen personally uh, is not necessarily in the methodologies. Uh, but I spend an enormous amount of time with all companies training people to think differently. Not to think about, I'm going to build a single model and then I'm going to do a prediction, but to really start thinking Bayesian. That has been the hard part. Uh, and uh, we actually just started, a, uh, last year we started a project with, with Exxon on Bayesian modeling of uncertainty. So it's still, even in the oil industry, it's, it's still catching up, right? It's the traditional way of thinking is deterministic, it's classical frequentist, Bayesian is still even there, not arrived. And so that's what we, COBOL, we are hoping to, to do, is that do that uh, very fast. Okay, I, we see we arrive here at 12 o'clock. Um, <clears throat>